Tom, today we will talk about some of the most controversial questions arising from your My Big Toe theory. You've had a lot of questions and concerns from your readers about what you call a free will awareness unit, that is, us as an avatar. In other words, the body we inhabit here in this reality. People might easily identify with the movie Avatar, where the character in one reality becomes the blue alien character in another reality by logging on into this other reality. This movie possibly makes it easier to understand the concept of virtual reality. Now, this leads us to the questions. Who are we really here? How much of us do we retain in this reality? And what parts of us do we retain as consciousness? Okay, I can talk to that a bit. This is, uh, this is a question that uh, a lot of people have. It's um, a question that is, that is a problem for some people. They get a little upset about uh, the, uh, my big toe theory on this particular issue. And I noticed that you used the word log on, which is a good modern metaphor for what's going on here, where the consciousness logs on to the avatar. You know, that's what we do in our video games. You, know, you log on as your elf, or you log on as your Sims character. You log on to the game, and then you play that particular character. Um, before that, before we had that as a, as a metaphor, before there were such things as virtual, virtual realities, people had the sense of the consciousness inhabits the body. And it was more like the consciousness somehow lives inside the body or takes over the body or, uh, you know, it's the, the spirit goes into the body. And that's where the term out of body comes from. It's, it's the idea that uh, you are spirit and you get to leave the body or the spirit goes into the body, but the body is a separate thing that spirit somehow lives inside of it. And that's kind of the old metaphor back from two or three, four hundred, a thousand years ago when um, that was the way, you know, when they thought of themselves, their own physical bodies as being fundamental, therefore the spirit had to somehow enter their body. And uh, that really is not a very good metaphor any, anymore. It's not a very accurate metaphor, although many people still use it, and the word out-of-body experience is still used. So it's a you know, kind of historical metaphor that people now begin to realize is not very literal, not very accurate, but it's still used as a metaphor. So. Anyway, I noticed that, uh, that you, you mentioned the log on. That is a, a much better one to start with because what happens is that you have a virtual reality that makes virtual characters. Now, these virtual characters don't have souls in the sense of something that lives in them. They don't have brains that compute or think or store or analyze anything. They're virtual characters. They're just like the elf. You, your bodies, just like the elf and the elf's body. The elf doesn't think with his brain. The elf's body isn't fundamental. You, the consciousness, don't live in the elf's body. You see, but from the elf's point of view, you are the one making all the choices. You're the choice maker. If you say, elf, run away, elf, fight, elf, jump up and dance, you see, the elf will do what you say for the elf to do, and the elf believes that that's his own, that that's his own consciousness in the sense doing that. Well, it is. It's his consciousness. What he doesn't understand is his consciousness ex exists in another reality frame, in a, you know, uh, with a, somebody sitting in front of a computer holding a mouse or a joystick. That's where the consciousness lives, not in his frame. His body is just the avatar. So we get that idea that consciousness is inhabiting our body or is, comes from our brain because of the sense that we feel that we as virtual characters, we don't feel virtual. We feel as real as real can be. And we think that we are it, we're the center, 
and this idea that our consciousness really is something that exists in another reality frame outside of ours is like, what? You know, that doesn't make any sense. Surely consciousness is a product of the brain. Well, we know that's not true. There are people who virtually have no brain, have just little tiny thin membranes around the inside of their skull and a little brain stem, and they do very well. They, you know, grow up, go to school, get degrees, you know, go to graduate school, you know, get PhDs, they uh, have families and jobs, and they're perfectly normal, yet they have no center that works the nervous system, they have no uh, visual cortex, they have no auditory uh, it's part of their brain, they don't have any of the part that controls the breathing or the muscles or anything else, they don't have any uh, cerebrum that does the, an the analysis and the logic, they don't have any of that, yet they function just as well anyway. So we have direct physical evidence, if you like, really virtual evidence, right, in a virtual reality, but we'll call it physical evidence, that a brain is not necessary to function. The brain really doesn't do any of those things. All of that's done in consciousness. Your memory is the memory of consciousness. Your analysis is the analysis of consciousness. Your judgments, all of those things that we attribute to the brain are really functions of consciousness. All, the f all that virtual body, all that avatar does is set the constraints on what that consciousness has to work with. So the, you know, you can't make that elf do anything more than the rule set for the World of Warcraft game allows it to do. So World of Warcraft has a rule set and that elf has certain characteristics. And you, the consciousness, have to work within those characteristics. Okay? And that's all any of the physical body does. It's, it sets the limitations, it sets the constraints of the rule set for the player, for the consciousness. Okay, so that's the, that's the significance of, of that. So who are we? People have this idea that they are the body, that they are you know, the avatar. They feel that's their identity. Say, who are you? Well, they are this person. They are, you know, Joe Jones, and they live at this place and work at that job, and they identify with the avatar. Well, if this is a virtual reality, that avatar, that avatar's brain, and everything about that avatar is just ones and zeros on a hard drive someplace. Ones and zeros on a hard drive don't think, don't store, don't do anything. You see, they're just a picture. There is something that keeps track of the constraints that the rule set has on the consciousness, keeps track of the interactions. That's what that does. So who are you? Well, you have to think in a little bigger picture and say, well, I'm not really the avatar. I'm not a bunch of ones and zeros in a computer because that's really nothing at all. It could be ones and zeros on a piece of paper. You know, I'm not a collection of ones and zeros because that has, that's inanimate. So who are you? And then you'd have to say, well, I'm the consciousness. I'm the player. That's who I am. And this body is just my avatar. So now if you identify yourselves as the consciousness, that's what I call the free will awareness unit. Okay, so now you are the free will awareness unit, which is that little chunk of consciousness that's playing this particular avatar. Well, then we back up one more level. Where does that free will awareness unit come from? And we then would say, oh, well, the free will awareness unit is just a piece of the individuated unit of consciousness. It's just a piece of that. It's a, the individuated unit of consciousness takes a portion of itself uh, not any of its uh, intellect, but just its quality, and lets that start off with an avatar. And that's the free will awareness unit. It's just a piece of an individuated unit of consciousness. And when that avatar dies, or gets run over by a truck, or whatever takes it out of that particular game, then that free will awareness unit returns, basically melds with, goes back into, you know, the partition 
the, the partition memory that uh, created that free will awareness unit dissolves and it's no longer partitioned anymore and it goes back into the individuated unit of consciousness. So now, who are you? Well, you are sort of the avatar in the sense that the avatar limits what you can do. You are the free will awareness unit in the sense that you're there to play an avatar and you are a individuated unit of consciousness which is the cumulative function that takes all of the lifetimes for all the avatars that you've ever experienced and learns from them all because you can learn you can learn more from the accumulation of those experiences than you can from just the individual experiences themselves from the accumulation you can see trends you can see problems you can see successes you can see ways of being that don't work and ways of being that do work and from that bigger picture, you are better able to take your next experience with another avatar. Okay. Now, you can back up another level yet. And you can say, well, where does that individuated unit of consciousness, what's its source? And that would be just the larger consciousness system. That would be the consciousness, you know, the one, if you will, the consciousness system of which everybody is a part. And that's what you really are, is a piece of that, you see. But you're an individuated piece of that. And that individuated piece of that can take a piece of itself and make it a free will awareness unit, which can then play an avatar. So you see, when you ask the question, who am I? It backs up through several stages. Oh, I'm the avatar, and I'm a free will awareness unit. I'm an individuated unit of consciousness, and I'm one with the larger consciousness system. So you're all of those things. You're a multidimensional individual that interacts and operates on many different levels. That's who you are. The avatar is the least of them, but that's where you gain your experience. So in that case, the avatar is very important important because that's where you make choices. That's how you grow up and that's how you evolve. So that avatar is a very important part of it, but it's an expendable part. When the avatar is done, the avatar is done. The free will awareness unit goes back into the IUOC, which then integrates all of the experiences together and learns from them. So learning has to be a serial experience, not a parallel experience. Learning has to be cumulative. One learns through an accumulation of experience, and that's what the individuated unit of consciousness does. So you see, this question, who am I, has a lot of answers, depends on your perspective. From the smallest perspective, you're an avatar. From the next higher one up, you're a free will awareness unit. From a bigger perspective yet, you're an individuated unit of consciousness, and a bigger perspective yet, you're at one with everything. You're one with the larger consciousness system. So that's who you are. You're really a chip off the old block. You're a piece of that larger consciousness system. That's who you are. But that then interacts with other individuated units of consciousness. You know, the, the individual unit of consciousness interacts with each other. That's part of the strategy of the larger consciousness system evolving. That makes its evolution more efficient, more effective. So then you get to play that role, very important role. But still, that's like being in a big chat game. It's just uh, exchanging information with other IUOCs. And there's not a lot of traction there on your choices. There's not a lot of consequences. So now you create a virtual reality in which a part of that IUOC can play in. And that's what the free will awareness unit is. So see, now I've gone up and back and up and back a couple of times so you can see how all these things relate. And, you know, the question, well, which is the real me? They're all the real you. All of them are the real you. They all have their limitations, though. The only one that is unlimited is the one where you're just one with the larger system. But you can experience through all of those modes. You experience the avatar. You can experience being the free will awareness unit. You can experience the IUOC. And you can experience being one with all. You can have all those experiences because you are consciousness. And consciousness is a part of all those things. So we 
we think we're the avatar, we can sit down and meditate and we can get into a state where we feel like we are one with all. Well, that's just us in that larger perspective. We can also catch ourselves as what we sometimes call our higher self. Well, that's just the individual unit, unit of, individuated unit of consciousness. That's us at that level. We can also catch ourselves at the, um, you know, our present life and our past lives. Well, that's just a bunch of free will awareness units for all those past, past lives. So that's at that level. So we exist in all these levels and we shouldn't feel slighted or somehow cheated that that free will awareness unit dissolves back into the individuated unit of consciousness. That's not a problem. It is a problem for some people, but it's a problem because your ego and your beliefs have an attachment. They're attached to that, to that avatar and they don't want to let it go. They're attached to that avatar's relationships. You know, your beloved one or your child or your spouse or your parent or somebody that you're particularly close to and you want that particular relationship to last forever in this reality and out of this reality, but it doesn't work like that. When that avatar dies, that IUOC returns, I mean that uh, free will awareness unit returns to the IUOC, and then you go on to something else, and that beloved other does the same thing, and they go on to something else, and that something else, you may or may not be together. Now you might agree to meet up and go together again sometime, and that's possible. But for the most part, that's not what happens. For the most part, you look for what your next best incarnation is going to be, where you're going to learn the most and have the kind of challenges that suit you, and that's what you're going to do. You're not going to throw away an optimum uh, learning experience so that you can hang out. It's not about hanging out with uh, other entities that you like. You know, that's... Uh, that's what happens in the schoolyard, right? When the kids don't go to class, instead they hang out in the hall and they don't learn much. Well, that's not what you're here for. So it's not about hanging out with your old buds, it's about learning. And we go on to another learning situation that's kind of handcrafted just for us. And we may later on run up with some of those same consciousnesses again, but it's totally different then. They're not the old avatar, you see. Susie, your beloved spouse, or your sister, or your mother, when you meet her again, it's not Susie. Susie's gone. When Susie dies, her free will awareness unit gets absorbed again in its individual unit of consciousness. So Susie only lives on in the database. Susie and everything she thought, felt, said, all of that, and all of its different Combinations and permutations exist in probability inside the database. So there you can go talk with Susie, because Susie still exists as Susie was and all the things that Susie did and thought in the database. But otherwise, Susie, as a, as a uh, consciousness, uh, making free will choices, doesn't exist any longer, just as you don't when you make that transition. I think it brings us to a very important question for some of the psychic mediums that we're familiar with. They deal every day with deceased ones and helping others uh, cope with their deceased loved ones. Um, we are a collection of information. We are a collection of ones and zeros in a sense that all of our information from every past life is recorded. But when the psychic mediums contact someone or someone comes to them, it's more to them than just some information. It seems much more real to them in that the emotions and the fact that they can comment on things and events after their death. In other words, I can see that you got Johnny a new bicycle. Mm -hmm. And this makes it very 
real and mm -hmm. very alive. So even though technically it is simply information, can you explain more how this real, re this real interaction between the psychic mm -hmm. medium and the, the loved ones of the deceased are? Sure. Well, the, the problem here is, of course, our very prejudicial uh, definition of the word real. We think that what's here, what's physical, is real. So if it reminds us of the physical, then it's real. And if it doesn't, then it's not real, you see. And that's not the way it is, actually. We're the virtual reality that's computed, and the consciousness is a lot more real. And you say that, oh, they have, a, they have emotion, plus you can get information from them, like, uh, well, you know, I hid, uh, you know, $1,000 under the floorboard at the back of the bedroom, you know, under where, you know, the northeast corner of the bedroom. And you can go back and tear up that floorboard, and sure enough, there, there's that, that money that was hidden there 200 years ago, and you're talking with your ancestor. Well, then that must be real, because they had information about that. Well, it's still all information. It's just information. Of course that information is recorded, and yes, that, that database can give you that information. The emotions and feelings are also information, and they give you that information. And all of the attitudes, the ability to interact with things that are going on now, I see that you bought Susie a new bike. Okay, well that's commenting on a current event. Or they may comment on the, on the results of an election, you know, or something like that. Well, of course, that's a, all of that is information. But the thing is, when that information comes to us in a way that feels physical to us, feels like we avatars are used to experiencing, then we say, oh, that's real. That has to be real because it's just it's the emotion, it's the feeling, it's the accent, it's all the things. And even it's the visuals. The medium can say, well, I see a big man who's, uh, um, you know, heavy set uh, with bushy eyebrows and wearing a plaid scarf. And the other person may say, wow, that's exactly right. He was big and heavy set, had bushy eyebrows, and his favorite thing of all was that he wore when he went out was his plaid scarf. That's got to be real. You see, well, the realness of it is just whether or not it resonates with our sense of what is real, and our sense of what is real is what our avatar has experienced. So, of course, the information is going to come that way. I mean, how would it be if you had a medium and the medium said, uh, okay, I'm getting a picture. Let's see. I see a three-headed chicken and it's speaking French and it says that, you know, well, people would say, nah, that doesn't, that doesn't fit. That's not me. That's not him. He wasn't a three-headed chicken. This is crazy. You're, you're incompetent and they leave. So if you are going to, if the larger system is going to allow this kind of, this kind of, of interaction with the database, it's going to do it in a way that seems real. You're going to get a whole person with emotions and feeling and memories and all of that and an ability to talk about current events. The system's going to present it that way because that's a way in which the, the client, if you will, can get the information, can find value in the patient, can think this is real as opposed to I'm being conned by this medium. You see, so that produces credibility. So if the point is to deliver this information, and usually the point in these cases are where you're trying to heal wounds that have never healed yet between individuals still here and individuals deceased. And the wound healing doesn't really have to do with the deceased, it has to do with the individual still here. Okay, they have problems, unfinished business, connections, forgot to say I love you before the person died, uh, they, whatever it is. They want some comfort, some connection, some resolution, and that's why they're there. And it's in the system's best interest that they get that connection, that resolution, that they find some peace because now they can go on, they can grow up, they can evolve more efficiently if they're not carrying this wound, this, this problem around with them, you see. Or 
even if they are no, even if they just are learning that reality is bigger than just the physical. So the system may want to give them very accurate data about old Uncle Fred, you know, who was dead or whatever, right down to the scarf he wore or to the money's under the, you know, back corner of the bedroom. They may want to do that just so that person would learn that reality's bigger than it seems. You're opening them up. So there's lots of reasons why the system would want to make that information as complete, as real, as significant, as credible as possible. And it's got all the information. So it can present the correct image with the correct clothes on, with the correct attitude, with the correct bushy eyebrows, with, and it can discuss current events or anything else. This is a exercise in healing somebody, helping them on their journey of evolution with information and using the medium to make that connection. Because otherwise, that healing can't be done. That person's dead now. You know, it's hard to heal that wound between them. So that's what's going on here. So yes, it does seem real, quote unquote. It does seem just like they're still that same human form, that same person. And that makes people believe, oh, well, when you die, you live like that forever. You know, well, when Uncle Fred dies, he's always going to be heavy set. He's always going to have bushy eyebrows and he'll still be wearing his plaid scarf, you know, for eternity. That's, you know, for eternity, you don't get to change clothes. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't uh, lose weight and get in shape. You know, however it is you are when you die, that's the way you're going to be. You know, however people remember you. So you're, you're stuck like that. Well, that's not the way it is. Or not. You're not stuck anywhere. You, you go on as consciousness in some other virtual reality, some other event, adventure where you learn and grow and make choices. And this healing process going on between individuals with problems, with loved ones that are no longer around, well, that's, that is fed by the system because it helps those people grow up. And it's as real as it can be, otherwise it wouldn't work. It wouldn't help those people. Three-headed chicken won't do for those people, you see. They just throw it all away. No healing would take place. That's why it has to be real. So a medium will tell you that, yes, those people are out there and they exist just like you remember them. Well, that's a good metaphor and that's a good thing to say because that uh, kind of suits everybody because they don't really have a bigger picture. If they had a bigger picture, it wouldn't have to be that way. But because they have little pictures, then you have to feed them information in a little picture context. Otherwise, it's not credible. So that's what's going on. Basically, what the medium does is extract information from the larger reality, mm -hmm. which is the more fundamental reality. So it's very easy to see how that information is actually more real than any other any other concept you might have um, sure and the and the medium is also extracting information from their client so they they have a sense of the client's needs and the client's healing and the client's sense of credibility too and they will get in for, and so does the larger conscious system have a sense of all of it the larger conscious system has a sense of that medium is that medium truly a you know just trying to help and is that, in, is that client just uh, trying to deal with a problem that needs to be dealt with? And if the answer to both of those is yes, then the system's going to work with both of them to try to affect the largest amount of healing and growth possible. That's what the system does. Our growth is its growth. So the system's going to cooperate. That, that information will be available and will be put up front. Things will be delivered just purposely because they're evidential. You see, the, the, the medium will get a picture of bushy eyebrows just because that would be kind of evidential to their, to their clients. So they'll get things that are evidential. And stuff that's not even evidential or not pertinent to the healing, they don't get. To me, that's a bigger picture of looking at it. The medium is really working with the larger consciousness system, which is a far more significant, talented 
way of extracting the information because it's not just some sort of perceived paranormal thing that's coming into this reality. It's really working in the big picture. However, occasionally, would you say that with a recently deceased person, you may actually get the individual? Well, it's possible that when you have a, a uh, recently deceased individual, that you will actually be still talking to that free will awareness unit. It takes a while for that process of, of uh, letting go of the free will awareness unit, letting go of its avatar connection and reuniting with the individual unit of consciousness. That takes a little bit of time for that process to happen because it's, it's, it's not a psychological wham, you know, like a light flashes and everything's different, you know. It, it actually takes some time for people to get the concepts rearranged in a different viewpoint. So during that time, um, that kind of, that you could make that connection, and that free will awareness unit might still be enough of it still held together that it would contact you, yes. So that's possible. Um, more likely, though, is that even if you start with that, if the system sees that that's a profitable thing to do, the system then will pick it up and continuing it while that free will awareness unit goes back to its IOUC and the IUC goes on with the business of growing up and evolving. So even if it started that way, the larger kind of system would probably pick it up and continue it anyway. But it might because one of the things that happens to you in that transition of going from free will awareness unit to an IUOC, if there are a lot of things going on that will help you see your past experience in your past incarnation that you just left, see it from a, from a perspective that will be helpful to you, at that time you can get a lot of those flashbacks. You can see that. Uh, oftentimes uh, a free will awareness unit will be aware, let's say, of its own funeral. It can be aware of, you know, who came and who didn't, and what's, you know, and how that was. They can be, because they're, they're still kind of connected to that role. And if they were right in the middle of some major thing going on, they may actually see the resolution of that. You see, that may be something they do too. Or, if it would help them grow up some, they might see a series of people who are talking about them. Oh, remember old Fred? Yeah, he died last week. Uh, boy, he sure was a lazy old goon, wasn't he? You know, and he'll hear that. And that'll surprise him, and he'll think, well, you know, I guess I was. Or, you know, he sure was a troublemaker. Or he sure was a sweet guy. Everybody loved him. You see, they'll get little snippets like that that may be helpful for them to help understand and kind of pull together their experience from an overview. So they do pick up on some things like that. They may uh, still be active for a short time, but it's not all that long. Before long, they have to move on and get on with the business of, of evolution. They're not just going to hang around in case somebody wants to talk to them. You know, I go play a harp on a cloud until some medium calls them up on the phone and says, hey, I got somebody here who wants to talk to you. So it doesn't work like that. You have said it's an efficient system, and the efficient system has to keep keep going. So right. this, I hope this is very helpful to those who have these mm -hmm. questions. Well, yes, and, and another way to look at it is here we are, individuated units of consciousness at the, at the root, free will awareness units at a lower level and avatars at a lower level yet. Here we are and we think that well, the medium is really just getting data from a database that's not really Uncle Fred. Oh, well, you know, somehow that's a fake. That's not real. Data isn't real. Uncle Fred was real, but information isn't real. That's because they don't understand that Fred was never more than information in the database. 
Matter of fact, his avatar was nothing but ones and zeros. They don't get it that it's always just been information. Now it's information too, but information that had been played in a different way. Before Uncle Fred, when he was alive and interacting, he was information in a database being played by a consciousness. And you were also in a database interacting with Uncle Fred. But it was all information then. So now Uncle Fred dies, and now a medium brings back Uncle Fred. It's still just information. It never was anything more than information, or less than information. It's now just in a different form. It's a different uh, perspective that you're looking at the information. Nothing ever changes as far as that. It's all information. It's always, always, you know, it's always all been information. And it's never going to be anything more than information because that's what reality is, is information. So it's not like, oh, it's not really Uncle Fred. That's just some information out of a database. Well, it was nothing more than information out of a database ever. And then you say, you know, what about you? Well, as a as a avatar, your information, as a free will awareness unit, your information, as an individual unit of consciousness, that's information. And the and the larger consciousness system is an information system. See? So Uncle Fred as information is as real as Uncle Fred has ever been. It's not that that's the fake Uncle Fred or the stand-in Uncle Fred. That's as real as Uncle Fred ever was. It's the it's still Uncle Fred's information, if you will. So there's very little difference. The only difference between the Uncle Fred in the database and the Uncle Fred that walked around on Earth interacting with the other live people is the fact that the one walking around on Earth with other live people had a consciousness behind it, making choices, free will choices. The one in the database is no longer doing that. It's just a record of the way the one that walked around thought, felt, act, things he knew, his opinions, attitudes, and the things he would have said if he had, you know, different information. Well, let's give it. Uncle Fred a little bit more credit. He's part of the larger consciousness system, always was part of the larger consciousness system, and Fred was just a part-time gig. Yeah, yeah, the Fred that walked around was just uh, something he did because that helped his individuated unit of consciousness grow up because of the choices he got to make, because of the consequences that he had to face, because of the pain that he had to suffer. All of those things helped make Fred be what he was, helped him grow up. And that helped his IUOC, and his IOUC is there to help the larger consciousness system grow up. And the larger consciousness system just is. That's as far as we can go because we are consciousness, so we don't go outside of that system. So yes, Uncle Fred, has always been information, always played out. Right now, after his death here, he no longer is interacting with free will. He's available for consultations, conversations, and uh, he will say anything that, that, that Uncle Fred would have said otherwise. So to give a great deal of respect to the psychic mediums who have the real talent and ability to contact these people, they're contacting the larger consciousness system for help. They're being helpful to yeah. people. And um, I have a great deal, after this interview, I have a great deal more respect for what they do. Yes, the ones that are really good at it do provide a, quite a useful service because there are lots of people who have unfinished business with people who have died and that kind of sticks in their crawl, if you will, if they can't get it out. And the only way to get it out is with Uncle Fred. So that's a service to them, and uh, the mediums who, can, who are good at that provide a good service. Most of them don't really know how they do it, and most of them would swear that, no, that's not information in the database. That's the real Uncle Fred, because I can see him and smell him and hear him, and, and he laughs, and he has the personality, and he has all these traits. How could information be that? Well, it is. It's all this information. All that information in that level of detail is there. So this idea of people are unhappy because that's not the real Uncle Fred. Well, what's real? That Uncle Fred is just as real as any Uncle Fred. The only thing he's missing is he's not any longer in a free will interaction. He's interacting with you based on the probability of what Uncle Fred would say. 
the probability of what Uncle Fred would, you know, how he'd interact in some situation. And that probability is accurate down to the last detail. So. Well, thank you yeah. to those talented mediums. And we know one of them, Marla Fries. Um, we owe them a, a great deal of respect. Um, thank you very much. It's um, actually what they do is so much more in contact with the real world than the one that we're in. Thank you, Tom.